turn your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 7. And I'd like for you guys to read this together with me, if you would. It should be on the wall behind me as well. So let's read this together. Let's really, you know, let it be heard, okay? All right, Matthew 7, 1. Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite. <laughs> in your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So you got to stumble over that word hypocrite there a little bit, didn't you? <laughs> I thought I was the only one saying it, so... <laughs> Now, as we saw last week, Jesus has taught about the eye that is singularly clear, uh, meaning not divided in focus, because a divided eye, which is the window to the soul, a divided eye uh, will cause uh, double-mindedness in a person. And he has said that the righteousness of his disciples needs to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, and they were double-minded in their sense of righteousness. Uh, for instance, they gave alms to God, but also to be seen by other people. Uh, they prayed to God, but also to be heard by other people. They fasted before God, but fasted in a way to receive glory from other people. Uh, there is a laying up of treasure, then, Jesus said, on earth contrasted with the laying up of treasure in heaven. There is a division of sight, he said, between the eye that is full of goodness, full of light, and that that is full of darkness. There is a divided effort to serve both God and material things. And there is a division between anxiety over material things, and what we shall eat and what we shall be clothed with, contrasted with trusting God because we seek first the kingdom of God. And then there is a divided mind that criticizes or judges others, uh, but exempts oneself from examination. Uh, this is where we were there as we read our text this morning. So this is why Jesus referred to the judgmental scribes and Pharisees as hypocrites, because they were double-minded. Now, as we begin, let's look again at, at the first phrase there, the first sentence uh, in the text. Judge not that you, not, that you be not judged. The word judge here comes from a word in the original language having two primary meanings. The first we look at is to reach conclusions about another person that moves us to punish him or her. It causes us to just say, you know, I'm just going to mistreat them because of, of what they are doing. Uh, and so to punish them. And secondly, to condemn someone, like in a final condemnation, uh, because of a fault that we have observed in them. So why does Jesus command us to judge not? Now, uh, it is because Jesus came not to condemn, but to save. And he has given us that same calling. We are, are not to condemn either because we need to be pursuing uh, the need for salvation in the lives of people around us. Uh, very familiar scripture after John 3.16, which maybe people know more than any other scripture in the Bible just about. Uh, it says uh, for, in verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So you know what, if Jesus is not, did not, was not sent to go around condemning people, then who are we to do, to do that, right? We're following in the footsteps of Jesus, and we are to be as he. Now, verse 18 says, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So we see here that Jesus, you know, he didn't go around spending his time condemning those who did not believe. Uh, they are all, he says they are already living under condemnation. There's no need for us to condemn them because they're already there. And his objective is to offer, rather, a pardon and a new way of life to them. 
And this is a vital lesson that is given to the disciples for the mission that they are to carry out when Jesus ascends into heaven and the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them and they then are to go out and do the same kinds of things that he has been doing, which would not include condemnation. Now, so that's a lesson for us too. And this is a lesson we need to follow and pay close attention to. Uh, and uh, people who are still walking under condemnation should not be expected to live like a saint. We just know that they're not going to do that. So we don't need to go around pointing fingers at them because there's already one pointed at them, you know, in a sense. They're already uh, under that condemnation and, and they need an awakening in their heart that there's forgiveness. That there is a pardon for it and that there's a place of healing and restoration in their lives. To take an attitude of judgment will diminish effectiveness for ministry. A reminder of what can distort and diminish effectiveness in ministry actually takes place in, the, uh, in Samaria where Jesus and his disciples were refused hospitality by the Samaritans. And there were two of those disciples, James and John, that were rather upset about that. Uh, and Luke 9, 54, we begin to, to read a little bit about what happened there. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, that they were rejected for hospitality. Uh, when, he, John, when they saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Just as Elijah did. But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So they, you know, like the rest of us, they were a little bit of slow learners at times, you know, about the real intent of Jesus' mission. So he didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So are we vulnerable to taking that same attitude sometimes uh, that was exhibited by James and John? Uh, have you ever felt like calling fire down from heaven to consume someone? You know, or just for a moment maybe, Right. Or uh, some other means of destruction, you know, uh, somebody that uh, you were particularly upset about or, uh, or angry with. So, of course, we're vulnerable to that attitude. It matters not who people are or what they have done to deserve condemnation. Our mission is to pray for them that they would be able to come to Jesus Christ and have a transformation of their lives by the grace of God. That is our mission. And that is the main thing, and the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Right? This command by Jesus not to condemn was in contrast to the scribes and Pharisees. Here's an example, again, in the book of Luke, chapter 18. Uh, a little example that Jesus gives of this. He, he says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners and unjust and adulterers, and even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all I possess, and, and, and he beat his breast, and, uh, and, and the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, there were two times each day that people would gather at the temple to pray. At the beginning of the day, early in the morning, and at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And it was at these times that a lamb would be slaughtered, dismembered, and burnt as a sacrifice for the sins of the people. Then there would be a singing of hymns, and then there would be public prayers that would be said by the people, uh, prayers of thanksgiving for the forgiveness of sins. And the priest would then, he would be burning incense unto God, and, uh, and, and it would be a sweet aroma. The praises of the people and the prayers of the people would be a sweet aroma uh, unto the Lord. And it was during this time of prayer that these two men, the Pharisee and the tax collector, prayed such contrasting prayers. Now, one clearly believed he needed no forgiveness. He was, he was pretending that he was perfect, you know. And, he, and even gave a list of all the things he was doing right. 
And then all the, the list of all the things that this poor tax collector was doing wrong. So he was condemning this man, this tax, tax collector, even though that the sacrifice for sin had already been made. And the tax collector had been given mercy before God. He couldn't give the man mercy. You see the difference there? The heart of God is mercy. The heart of God is not to condemn, but to forgive and to give mercy instead. And so, uh, you know, uh, the, this is typical of the religious person who judges others. Uh, there is no self-examination by that person, only examination, rather, of the sins of others. Judging is sort of a slick way that people use to forget and cover up their own sins. Right? You ever done that? I think I probably have done that. No, I, I think I have done that. We cover up our sins by pointing out the sins of someone else. And this... Uh, you know, and that again, that's why Jesus called this Pharise the Pharisees at times, he called them hypocrites. Judge not does not mean that we are not to observe the difference between good and evil. That's not what Jesus is talking about. We are, it doesn't mean that we cannot call sin a sin or condemn sinful behavior. But we are not to condemn the person, but rather offer a solution instead. You know, that's God's business, the business of condemnation at the very end of, uh, you know, death comes and then comes the judgment. But that's up to God. That's not our job description. Our job description is to offer the gospel to people and that uh, God has offered a way to deal with it. But sometimes we hear uh, a person say, well, you know, Jesus said you're not supposed to judge. Have you ever heard that? And so when that happens, sometimes what is really going on there is that uh, some, re, uh, you know, some word of reproof has been given about some kind of behavior. And, and so and the, the person who's on the receiving end, they rebut that reproof by saying, well, you know, Jesus said not to judge. So you shouldn't be judging me. Well, you can safely say, you know what, I'm really not judging you, but I'm judging the behavior that's doing harm to your life, you know. Because that's what sin is. It's behavior that does harm. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's, it's difficult in, to, uh, in a person's life and relationships when something like that's going on. And so you're really doing that in a positive way. You're wanting to love that person enough to let them know that you care about them and, and that you'd like to, to see something good happen in their lives. We live in a culture that practices live and let live. My generation especially, that was the overriding theme and all the songs that were, you know, popular songs were about that, you know, and it just ushered in this whole thinking, live and let live. And the overriding theme in the Western world is that there's no absolute standards of behavior. And so when a Christian says something about what the scripture identifies as sin, well, he or she is accused then of trying to legislate morality or being intolerant or of being a negative person. And sometimes we're on the receiving end of that kind of criticism, aren't we? Uh, but that's not what Jesus was talking about. Judge not does not mean that we are, to, are not to discern either the difference between sound doctrine and flaky doctrine or error, heresy, that kind of thing. Uh, later, Jesus says to watch out for false prophets and false teachers. And he referred to them as wolves in sheep's clothing. So he said, watch out for those guys. They're pretending to be teachers and prophets, but they're really not. They're really using people for their own gain. And a few years ago, right here in this auditorium, uh, I was uh, speaking about some of the false teaching of several of the cults that are in our uh, in this country of ours and around the world and and a fellow in the service yelled at me in protest you know he was sitting right down there close to where Brent's sitting and so I I was able to to hear him and a few people around him heard him too and 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 so he was very angry and and after the service he came up and he was still angry and he just began to speak loudly to me and a couple of men in the church come and stood beside me and I, I wondered why they were there you know we see this guy was a lot bigger than me. 
Uh, and they said afterwards, well, Jerry, we felt like we wanted to make sure this guy didn't beat you up or something, you know, because he was that angry. And he said, I can't come to a church where there's anything negative said about other religious groups, you know. But that's the culture that we live in. And so error, you know, we need to be sure to understand that this is not speaking about, about that. You know, uh, there is sound doctrine, there is truth when it comes to what is tr well, true doctrine, and we need to be aware of that. And there are people who don't represent true doctrine, and by that I mean the things that the apostles taught uh, from what they'd learned from Jesus. The apostles of Jesus clearly exposed over and over the false teaching that would come into the church. So, what does it mean to judge not then that you be not judged? Well, there's another example of judging by the scribes and Pharisees, and we'll take a look at this in John chapter 8, beginning in verse 3. You notice that the scribes and Pharisees are in the middle of all this, right? The, then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded that such should be stoned. But what do you say? And this they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. And so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of you, yours? Has no one condemned you? You hear that? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. It's just Jesus standing there. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Are you beginning to see what he's talking about? He didn't come to condemn, but to save. And he, his intent was to restore this woman, to bring healing into her life, and set her on a better path. And she did. I have a little funny story. I I worked in the criminal justice system many years ago, and... and uh, uh, I worked uh, especially in the juvenile detention area uh, on behalf of the public defender's office and one day I went to represent a young teenage girl who had gone through the Teen Challenge program and gotten, gotten her heart to the Lord and was, had gotten on the right path and, and this, this little gal's lawyer didn't show up. So I was, in, I was in a different capacity with the public defender's office but I was standing there and the judge thought I was her lawyer. And so I stood there and I told the judge all about this girl and how even though she had messed up, she was turning her life around, that she had gone through this recovery program and God was really working in her life and all this. And he said, young lady, he said, I tell you, you got a really good attorney standing there beside you because he knew what to say. <laughs> and uh, I'm hoping the word doesn't get back to the office, you know. But then he looked at her and he he pushed down his glasses and looked at her like that and he said, Now, young lady, go and sin no more. And so he got it. That judge got it. Instead of condemning her to a sentence, he, can, he, he gave her the freedom to get her a fresh start with her life. And that's the attitude that we are to have as well. So in this situation, Jesus seems to have turned the tables on those guys. And the speculation is that Jesus was writing the names of the women that these men had divorced their wives for. They'd used frivolous divorce in order to get married to this other woman uh, because they, had, they no longer cared about their wife and their wives. And, and so are the, are the ones that they were lusting after in their hearts. And so the scripture tells us here that their hearts condemned them, their conscience condemned them or convicted them, and they had to walk away because they realized they too deserve condemnation. Interesting. True to his mission, Jesus chose not to condemn this woman, but rather forgave her, exhorting her to stop the sinful behavior. And she walked away justified, just like the publican, while the scribes and Pharisees walked away retaining sin in their hearts, 
when they condemned their own, when they condemned their own unrighteousness was revealed. So judge not that you be not judged, because it's going to come back and your own unrighteousness will be will be revealed. For with with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, one aspect of this reciprocal uh, judgment is that when we judge others, then we also come under the microscope. Just like those scribes and Pharisees, and our own faults will be revealed. Uh, there, there's another way we, as disciples of Jesus, will be judged. Uh, it's not going to happen while we're here on this earth. But in this case, it is the judgment of rewards or when we stand before what the scripture calls the judgment seat of Christ. Now follow me. When the Lord returns, we'll stand there before him and our works will be judged. And this is a judgment not for our sins, but, but a judgment of rewards. In 2 Corinthians 5.10 we read, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So like I said, this is not a judgment for our, our sins, but a judgment of our service to the Lord and how we've represented Christ. I used to think it was a judgment for sin, and, and I just thought that when I stood before the Lord, there would be like a movie of all my sins that everyone would see my mother would see it you know my grandma my grandpa would see it and I could see my grandmother just beginning to cry right in front of everybody you know she even thought I should shave off my beard you know when I got older you know but uh, no not at all this is a judgment of re rewards in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul wrote that some works are like gold, silver, and precious stones. And other works like wood, hay, and stubble. Only good for a burn pile. Okay? Uh, without belaboring the point, there will be works that the Lord will judge, and they will be useless works. And even harmful to the cause of the gospel of Christ. And I believe that any time the focus of our works is in a spirit of condemnation any works time and energy put into it will be judged as needing to go on the burn pile because that was not the mission that Christ gave to us it's not based upon the foundation that he laid okay on the other hand if our works are redemptive with an emphasis on God's love acceptance and forgiveness the judgment will be in the form of reward. Jesus came not to destroy, but to save. And he calls his followers to emulate his offering of grace to those who are weary with sin. And that is who we are to be. Now there's a transition. Jesus turned then his attention to the relationship that his followers have with each other. And what we have with each other. He said in verse 3, And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me remove the speck from your eye, and, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So in this segment, Jesus is not dealing with condemnation, but he's dealing with something that would be more termed as hypercriticism or fault finding. The emphasis is on fault finding with one another without doing any self examination of our, you know, of me or you. The picture Jesus draws here is pretty plain and simple, as well as being kind of comical. I mean, can you picture this? A guy's trying to examine the eye of another guy. And he's got a, a tube of force sticking out of his eye. And the tube of force is getting in the way. He can't even see into the guy's eye to find that speck. But he keeps trying. Or, you know what he's going to do? He's going to guess at it. Because he really can't see it. So he's going to jump to conclusions. We all jump to conclusions sometimes, don't we? I walked out to my Volkswagen van many years ago. 
And uh, I looked down at the wheel, and, and there was a liquid on the wheel. And I thought, oh no, I'm losing brake fluid. And so I knew what brake fluid smelled like, and so I swiped my finger on the fluid and, and uh, put it up to my nose. And as I turned my head, there was this black dog <laughs> walking away. And, and he was looking back at me with a grin on his face after having left his mark on my wheel. And I realized I'd reached the wrong conclusion, you know. It happens. Now this might be a reflection back on what he said about the eye that is singularly clear. To find a speck in a brother's eye requires a lot of close scrutiny and investigation so that we don't jump to conclusions that may not be true. Christians can spend way too much time scrutinizing the lives of other Christians, especially without making sure that their own eye is singularly clear. We're tempted to put people under the microscope and find their faults. In fact, we may spend so much time and effort looking at the specs of others that we become blind to the buildup of fault in our own lives. The picture drawn here by Jesus is like a doctor trying to remove a speck from a person's eye while he or she is nearly blinded by something much bigger. It can't be done. One time, a number of years ago, there was a doctor who was examined my eyes and, and he was trying to fit me with contact lenses. And so he put a contact lens in my right eye. And then he turned around to talk to somebody that was nearby for a couple of minutes. And then he turned back to me and he took the left contact lens and he put that also into my right eye on top of the right eye lens. And he said, well, there you go. I bet you can just see the world differently now, can't you? And I said, uh, no, sir, everything looks pretty fuzzy to me, you know. <laughs> and he said, it can't be. Because I tested you and I examined you, and you know, and that's this. I got the, I got it right. And I said, Doc, I think you need to know that you put both contact lenses in my right eye. <laughs> he said, Okay, I understand now. And so we had to start all over, you know. Jesus said, First, the plank must be removed from the examiner's own eye. The eye must be singularly clear. Otherwise, there is a double-minded view of things. There have been many mistakes made in finding fault with others. First of all, until we examine the issue from that person's perspective, we may make a wrong diagnosis. The point is that when we decide to critique a fellow Christian's walk, or his life, or her life, we must first deal with our own stuff. A plank is simply a composite of many specks. The speck and plank are related. It is often the case that we find a fault in someone else that we ourselves are guilty of, but even in greater measure. And so to keep from dealing with our own fault, we look at the fault of someone else. We simply are not qualified to examine the life of another unless we have first done careful self-examination and dealt with our own faults. Then you will have a clear mind and heart to help a brother or sister with the speck in his or her eye. Paul gives some guidance about this in Galatians chapter 6. And he says this, he says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a man in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And for if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Now we see here what is prerequisite to being able to restore someone who is overtaken in a trespass and we become aware of it. Make sure, first of all, there's no impediment in your own spiritual walk. He says those who are spiritual. Who are the spiritual? 
with those who have dealt with their own issues, their own faults, first of all. You who are spiritual, he says. This means the one seeing the speck in a brother's eye has taken care to make sure of his, that his or her own heart has been made clean and clear. What else is an indication of who is spiritual here? The spiritual person will have a spirit of gentleness in examining a, a fault of another. The spiritual person has the goal of restoring the one overtaken in a trespass rather than critiquing and criticizing and talking about them. The word restore here was used to describe a doctor who is setting a broken bone. And I had a broken bone one time that had to be set. And you know, the doctor didn't yank it around and say, yeah, yeah just knock it around, see if he can, oh, look how loose that is and things. He didn't do that. He just was very careful with that broken arm I had. The spiritual person knows he or she is vulnerable to the same temptations. In fact, Paul noted that there's no temptation but such is common to man. This keeps us from being judgmental. The spiritual person will provide support to the other person uh, and, and that it's overtaken in a trespass. And don't be like the doctor who diagnoses the problem and then refuses to provide treatment. You know, a doctor has the responsibility not just to diagnose, but to, to be a healer. The spiritual person knows he or she, in and of himself or herself, is nothing. No superior attitude going on here. The spiritual person is humble, knowing that being overtaken in a trespass can happen to anyone. Right? Can happen to any of us. In closing this morning, I'm reminded again of an illustration I heard from Pastor Chuck Smith. He used it at a pastor's conference speaking to church leaders and pastors. He told of when he and a friend were eating in a restaurant one day and, and there was a gunshot just out in the street in front of the restaurant and a man had been shot. And he said the ambulance arrived along with the police. And he said the police were going around asking everybody, did you see who shot this guy and what happened here? You know, did anybody know the guy who, was, who shot the gun and, and all this kind of thing? And they didn't pay any attention at all to the victim of the gunshot. But the paramedics had arrived just before the police and that they were all about the victim. They didn't ask anybody any questions about, well, who did this and... How did it happen? And what's going on here? Were any of you, any of you have a gun? You know, none of that kind of thing. Because they were there to heal the man or to save his life. And then Pastor Chuck looked at all of us and he said, uh, Pastors, we are to be more like those paramedics and less like the police. It's not just for pastors. It's for us all. Sometimes we can fall into this role of being like the police with our brothers and sisters. But we need not do that. We all need restoration sometimes. We need help. We need forgiveness. We need rest restoration to wholeness. We need to be all about that. Many years ago, I knew a man from Zimbabwe. I think the country may have changed its names now or something, but in Africa. He gave oversight to many churches there. But he said before he became a Christian as a young man, all he heard in churches was that he was going to hell. But no one, he said, told him how to miss it. They just wanted to be sure he felt condemned and that he was going to hell. And finally, he had an encounter with the love and the grace of God that transformed his life. And that's why he had such a great ministry of proclaiming the love, acceptance, and forgiveness and the grace of God towards sinners. You know. Guys, our mission is not to judge, not to condemn, but to lead people into God's plan of redemption. Our calling with one another is not to be like fault-finding policemen 
but to be intent on keeping our own hearts clean so that we can be ready like paramedics to restore in a spirit of gentleness those overtaken by a fault. That is the main thing. And may we always keep the main thing the main thing. Matthew 6.22, once again, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, in other words, it doesn't have a plank in it, your whole body will be full of light. That is the main thing. When the eye is singularly clear, with no plank sticking in it, then we are ready to fulfill the mission of redemption and restoration that Jesus Christ has passed on to each of us. So let's get to it. The world needs to hear about his love and grace. But those who are not believers know that they, they're under condemnation already. They, they're searching for something. They can't find it. And we need to help them find it. And we need to always be kind and generous and gracious with the people in our world. No matter how badly someone might treat us. And that's the way the early church wound up gaining so much ground. is because they emulated that nature of Jesus. That did not come to condemn but to save. Let's stand together. Now we get a chance to go out and practice it. Yeah. Father, thank you so much for loving us while we were yet sinners, while we were your enemies. We know you didn't love us because you were attracted to us. You thought we were just really great to be with. But rather you loved us because we needed your love we needed your mercy we pray that you would fill our hearts Lord with that same kind of love toward the people of our world and fill our hearts with that same kind of love toward one another when one of us stumbles that we would be ready with loving kindness to help each other up again and get going again and be restored we ask these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.